and welcome to Basic Folk, where we have honest conversations with folk musicians on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network. I'm Cindy House, here with Lizzie No. Hey, Cindy. Hey, before we get down to brass tacks here, I want to tell you that we have a monthly newsletter, and you can sign up for it at our website, basicfolk.com, and you click on the red sign up for the newsletter button. Or you can follow us on social media, at Basic Folk Pod. We are a listener-supported podcast. If you have been listening for a while and have been meaning to make a contribution, you can do so at basicfolk.com. You can get one of our beanies in the shop, Basic Folk beanies that are handmade by my mom. Um, Those are available, and you'll be supporting this podcast. So we tape these intros two weeks before the episode drops. Um, So right now we are living in the past and the Nashville shooting has just occurred. And I feel like everybody is really fucking sick of this shit. Um, And there's not really much else to say. Uh, We need gun control now. We need smart gun control. The Washington Post put this article up. The date of the article was March 27th Mm -hmm. and it's called The Blast Effect. This is how bullets from an AR-15 blow the body apart. It's not bloody, but it is very upsetting and informative and something that you could send to somebody that you know who is against gun control. I think it's really good to look at from that medical perspective, like what these un believable, monstrous weapons due to the human body and how far we have gone in this insane direction. I saw a really great tweet yesterday from Dr. Tressie McMillan Cottom. There was an interview with a Republican politician about like, what are you going to do about gun control? And he was like, well, my kids are homeschooled, so not really going to do anything about it. So what Dr. Cottom was saying was, in case you haven't completely guessed the Republican game, their school shooting solution is women at home in the private sphere and charters, but mostly just women at home. It's all reproductive justice. So I was just like thinking about how we've seen so many attacks on reproductive freedom, motherhood and parenthood, family leave. These issues are all interconnected because if Republicans had their way, It would just be women at home taking care of their kids. We would be scared to participate in public life. Public schools would be just absolutely gutted. And all of these issues are connected. And there are people who are actively working to make it impossible for the majority of people to safely participate in public life. And it's despicable. And I really, I feel for those parents that are without kids right now. And like those little kids who whose entire perception of reality and safety is just shattered right now. Yep. Yep. Sorry, that was a little long-winded, but mm. No, something to something to think about. Yeah. Okay, now let's talk about our dogs. How's your dog? <sighs> my dog is good. He is my joy. He's been very cuddly lately in the mornings, which I need badly. He doesn't sleep with me at night because of boundaries. But he comes in in the morning after his walk to have a little morning cuddle. And he... Oh, that's nice. I have stuffed animals on the bed and he likes to try to blend in. Where's Berlin? Oh, there he is. <laughs> like E.T. He's behind the teddy bear. <laughs> yeah, he is E.T. We need to, oh, Let's wow. share a photo on our social media of Berlin disguised in the bed. How's your dog? Puddles is great. We went to this dog training class in the rain well it had just finished raining and it was on a field and there was probably like 30 other dogs there and it was basically like a small marsh because like all the uh, there was like so much water there was also a 30k going on in the background (laughs) so we have all these like terrible things happening so like the weather is really bad the ground is super wet the uh, 30k announcement is going on in the background and they're like announcing everyone as they cross the finish line 
Jimmy Sullivan and his cousin Sarah, they are crossing the finish line now every 10 seconds. So you're trying like, to like do a dog speaker. obedience and calming and mindfulness moment. Yeah. When there are 30 other dogs, sort of mud puddles as far as the eye can see and loud mm-hmm amplified noise every 30 to 60 yeah. seconds is that okay yes cool yeah yeah super cool. and our our instructor her <laughs> name is michelle if anyone is looking for a dog trainer this is a great company it's called say it once dog training not an ad uh, <laughs> they are in pittsburgh and in nashville they're excellent and she was the trainer and something that i've realized about say it once is that their trainers swear like she says the f word like every other sentence. Ooh, I like that. She is coming to our house to do a session. And so we were texting. I actually sent you a screenshot of what Michelle called Puddles. But I was like, we have a cat and Puddles is having a hard time getting along with the cat. And Michelle is like, don't worry, we will get the homie Puddles up to speed. Oh. So now I, I just keep I just keep calling my dog the homie Puddles. The homie Puddles. She is the homie. Today, our guest on the podcast is William Prince. I feel like I should have said that 15 minutes ago. That's but fine. I didn't. Lizzie, take it away. I love William Prince's music. William spent a long time recording his debut album, like a really long time. By the time Earthly Days was released in 2015, Prince had lived a lot of life and was ready for the sort of instant stardom that would throw a lot of emerging singer-songwriters for a loop. His first album was a huge surprise hit, and a number of extraordinary things happened following its release. His song Breathless was a hit on the Billboard adult contemporary music charts. William won the Juno Award for Contemporary Roots Album of the Year, and he ended up touring the hell out of this album for several years, way longer than most people tour their debut album. Um, He ended up opening up for artists like Neil Young, and taking this extended tour gave William the opportunity to basically perfect his live set in a way that a lot of new artists don't get to. William has gone deeper and deeper and deeper with subsequent releases. He describes love and loss and self and community and fear and courage with universal appeal on 2020's Reliever. He reinterprets the orthodoxy and aesthetics of his Christian upbringing through an indigenous lens on gospel First Nation, and he's synthesizing varied traditions and flexing impressive vocal chops almost casually. It's so complex and so fascinating, but deceptively simple and relatable. William's new record, Stand in the Joy, comes out on April 14th on Six Shooter Records, and it is a catchy, ambitious testimony about the power of love and hope. Talking about the album with William gave me the chance to ask him about his evolving spirituality, the tension between tradition and trendiness in Roots music, how the loves of his life change how he shows up as a performer, what it's like to work with superstar producer Dave Cobb, and what freedom looks like from a Peguis First Nations perspective. It's a really fun album. One of my favorite songs is Goldie Hawn. I don't know which song you've chosen to play for the for the pod, but it's a super fun new Roots record. Ooh, let's play that one then. Um, if you're listening in real time, William's album comes out tomorrow. Tomorrow! You're listening after our podcast release. The album is out now. And if you haven't listened to William Prince's music before, I just want to prepare you that you should be sitting down when you listen to him for the first time <laughs> because his voice is arresting. Like there's no way mm. to describe the tone and the power of his voice in a way that will properly prepare you. So take it in stride. <laughs> That's a good description. All right, let's listen to Goldie Hawn and then we'll get to our conversation between Lizzie No and William Prince on Basic Folk. She's a movie you leave on Cactus flower Goldie Hawn Mercy in the way she talks Easy answers Sweet surrender Feels like the swing 
surrender of love She's a record on the table Reckless daughter Joni Mitchell Grace inside the way she carries A willing heart That still surrenders Sounds like the sweet Surrender Of love Hi, William Prince. Welcome to Basic Folk. Thank you so much for sitting down to talk with me today. Um, first things first, congratulations on playing the Grand Ole Opry, and I'm curious how it went. Thanks for having me. Um, nice to be back here. Uh, Grand Ole Opry, that's what everybody is wondering right now. Um, it was it was more than I expected. It was It was huge, like it's the community there, you know, sometimes, sometimes Nashville can feel a little, well, quite commercial. And yes. it was, it was nice to go to a place where it feels like tradition was still very much in place. And, um, just, just the vibe of it, you know, knowing that so many people have been there that I admire, mm-hmm. it just felt like a really crowning moment, um, after, you know, doing this for some time and then you get to go play on country music's biggest stage. It's pretty, pretty surreal. I don't know. I, it was gone in a flash and the, <laughs> the, the, the people, the people were great. You, you get in there and you see these, this auditorium full and the sound check was great and the band is great. And it's just, yeah, it was really, I guess nothing quite like, nothing quite like the Opry. Yeah, I'll bet. Can you tell me a little bit about your early musical education, like how you first got into music, first started playing guitar, first started writing songs? Yeah, I, um, geez, I I feel, where do we begin, you know? Um, (laughs) Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Baby William, what was your first, like, musical (laughs) outlet? Were you a singing type kid? I think I was always musical a little bit. Mm-hmm. My my dad had my my story really starts with him. You know, he was the musical influence, and mm-hmm. my family. My my mom was a singer, and he was a musician. They sang together, and um, just loved the joy of music really in our house. So I was lucky that that was the start. Just having great music around me. Um, you know, I talked before about my origins uh, mm-hmm. in terms of the great singer songwriters of of time, but like uh, it was it was their music that influenced me the the Johnny Cashes and the Christoffersons and the Beatles and mm-hmm. the Beach Boys, Whitney Houston, all that good stuff was all mixed in our house, and um, I just really took to music. I. I, I always enjoyed it and eventually got to a point where I started to get curious because my dad would play music and it just naturally lent itself to my own curiosity where I wanted to play guitar too and started writing poems in high school. I was always a creative writer, you know, it wasn't always music or songs or poetry, but that lent itself to crafting songs once I got better at playing instruments and yeah, from there I just started to build a repertoire of of my own original songs you know um Mm -hmm. it was tough too because when you're young and you hear popular music really only on commercial radio it Mm -hmm. can make you feel like you know it has to be that if you want music to be successful as well and it took me a while took me a while to find my own voice i Mm -hmm. started off in rock bands in high school and played coffee shops in university and Finally, at 29, I made a recording, and right. that was eight years ago. I just turned 37 not long ago, and I was getting to a point where I thought education or going into med school or something like that was going to be my path, and didn't put any music in the world. You couldn't, mm-hmm. I couldn't leave my music career behind without putting some music out, so 
And finally, I got motivated enough to make a record here in Winnipeg. And yeah, everything changed from there. Uh, so I'm, I'm very much the product of my parents' influence and, and all the greats of our time. You know, uh, we something really great I heard is that we imitate what we love at the beginning. And I went through all the phases of wanting to be in a rock band and mm -hmm. admiring great songwriters and then just kind of... Uh, trying to emulate what they do through my own stuff. Do you remember the first time you performed your own songs in front of an audience? Yes, I was quite young back in uh, my home community of the Pegwas First Nation. It would have been would have been at the community hall for a fundraiser or something, some kind of community event and mm -hmm. trying out my own songs for the first time and but really, um, if you want to talk about the first songs ever, I'd, maybe, I'd, maybe I'd qualify them as the gospel songs I would have written sure. from, from my dad. You know, my dad was a, he was a gospel artist. He was a, a preacher, and his influence had a lot, uh, was very present in my life. You know, if anything, I was, I was the one setting up the guitars and the amps for him, you know, mm -hmm. and he'd be getting things ready and... I would lug the equipment around and get it ready for different services or funerals or wakes or whatever it was. Those were those were his gigs, truly serving the people and the community with mm -hmm. with music. Because you know he could sing, he could sing the old hymns, and so yeah, a, a lot of that, a lot of the framework for my music comes from traditional kind of well, traditional gospel music, just in terms of. Verse, chorus, verse, chorus, right. maybe a bridge sometimes. Maybe. Maybe. It's not very often <laughs> you find bridges. And uh, so, yeah, it, it all stems from that. It was it was a family thing. And that's that's what kept us going there. So when it came time for him to finally start recording, everybody was asking him to make records. And I wanted his gospel records to stand out. And so I wrote him a few songs and he loved them and recorded them that did a lot for my confidence at 14, mm -hmm. 14 15 years old you know first time ever in a studio and my dad's recording some original material that I had written right so you were already like in the truest sense a working songwriter in the sense that like your music was already being useful to your whole community before you kind of had your own name out there can you talk a little bit about that long road to your debut album, Earthly Days? It sounded like there were some hiccups and bumps along the road. Yeah, it wasn't without its challenges, that's for sure. You know, um, it, it was everything. I was I was working through university. I was I had a job. I, I wanted to play more music full time, and um. That's where you. That's where you really determine if you want it or not. Do you work? Oh, yeah. Do you wake up thinking about this thing? Do you almost obsess about it? And how do you get better? You know, I, I studied a lot of great music so that I could maybe contribute to it. In mm -hmm. and then it just it was just a matter of. I'm lucky. I was never really a shy kid. I was never shy to speak or read aloud in class. And my dad mm -hmm. and mother were very very confident speakers my dad since passed my mom's still alive um, but I had good influence around me and so the journey was really about just how do I get better you know uh, I, I, I wanted to work on my singing my my voice wasn't where it is right now I'm still working on my singing I'm I don't even uh, <laughs> I don't really register myself as a much of a singer I feel like I'm giving TED Talks over melody sometimes. and uh, <laughs> but Well, we're going to get to some of your vocal performances, <laughs> but that's interesting to think about how you didn't necessarily think of yourself as a singer in those early days. Yeah, it took a while. It took a while to settle into my voice. Like I said, you know, mm -hmm. influenced by popular music and radio, and uh, my voice just didn't sound good like that. And then it wasn't until... I don't know when the switch happened, but it was probably 10 years or so ago now where I started to write songs that were more to the beat of my own heart and stuff, you know, mm -hmm. 
slower songs that just focused on lyrics and almost like in the form of poetry, I guess. And that resonated with people. And once that door opened, mm -hmm. it really let me take a deep breath and, and be comfortable in the thing that I bring rather than trying to fit in or sound like somebody else. It's like, no, oh, these are the... These are the, the workings of my life and what I've seen. Sure. And, and most great artists that influence somebody or, uh, you know, have music that's impactful are the honest ones who just take stuff from their own lives and, and try to put it out there and be vulnerable. And that struck the right chord with people. And I'm glad because there's no other way to write them. I'd hate to, not hate, I'd, it would be tough to venture outside that and try to create something that, isn't authentically me. And right. And the tempo thing is interesting because those mid-tempo ballads that you really excel at, they take a maturity. Like if you're, if you're just kind of taking your first instinct after listening to pop music, I think often things come across as rushed and your music has a very deliberate pacing that it sounds like you've worked really hard to get to. Yeah, I wanted the message to be received, and um, <clears throat> now I'm now it's nice too because I have completed these little speeches almost, you know. And now I'm curious as to like a band sound, a more graduated sound. I wanna I want people to feel the music in a different way and move to it. And there's just there's just biology to music, ph physiology that certain beats and certain tempos, they will affect you and move you in certain ways. And I think because of the subject matter, you know, in my first records, I was dealing a lot with, with grief and heaviness and loss and heartbreak and becoming a father and all these things that required some serious attention. And I just thought it lent itself that mid-tempo range so that mm -hmm. the message wouldn't be lost and not to say it wasn't fun or joyful, it's just a matter of how I wanted it to be received. And that debut album, Earthly Days, had a huge impact. You won a Juno Award, you toured that album for, was it about four years? Yeah, it was a long time. <laughs> can you can you talk to our listeners about who might not be musicians about like what is unusual about that? Like it is unusual for a debut album to have that kind of reach and to be toured live for that long. Mm. I'm curious if there are things you learned about yourself as a performer that you didn't expect um and what was really unusual about that first album cycle for you. Well, the first album was really just I, I didn't. I didn't even have the foresight to see what it would be or could potentially be. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought if I could print CDs, that would be my music career. Yes. I finally have because I grew up in that kind of older model. That's what my dad would do. He would travel. Right. He'd play a show, you know, do a service or something, and then people would often buy, you know, ten, fifteen copies of a CD. And we were, we were not wealthy, but. You know, to have an influx all of a sudden of that cash was was a great thing for keeping going, putting gas in the car, mm -hmm. feeding your family, staying on the road, going to another church, another family's house to sing or do whatever. And so what happened was I, I finally made this record. Um, it came out in Canada and uh, it was it was well received. You know, it, it there was some excitement around it and. Canada was the first to embrace me as my home territory, you know, and so suddenly this record comes out. I'm a brand new voice on the scene and uh, people are excited about it. You know, being an indigenous performer as well, really, it was just there were extra eyes on it. You know, I always say First Nations people have to work 50 percent harder on top of everything just to be seen as equal and recognized. And all of a sudden this album kind of blew up in its humble way, you know? And so I spent the next two years touring Canada. Everybody wanted me to, from coast to coast, you know, come play our little folk fest, come play our house show, come play. So I did, you know, hundreds of gigs in this two year span. And all of a sudden I was, 
uh, playing to bigger crowds. And then um, when I performed at the Junos for the In Memoriam for Leonard Cohen and all the people that had passed that year, um, it landed me a, an American record deal. There are people in the audience that you know, showed interest. And then that started a whole new cycle. So this is already two years into it. And then we re-release Earthly Days with a new cut of the song Breathless that we did with Dave Cobb down in Nashville at RCA at the time. That song then starts to get popular in the UK because it's the it was the hold music for Vodafone. And I start to tour the UK a little bit more and go back there multiple times. And then Year four is when the States, you know, the U.S. starts to catch wind of what I'm doing. And it it just takes time to get to these places. You know, you're driving and flying and playing these shows that are sometimes 75 to 200 people in the beginning. And that's a lot of ground to cover and a lot of places to go. And uh, so it took that long for the word to get out, really. Um and then just playing catch up in different territories was what made Earthly Days such a long touring cycle. And I'm gr- I was really grateful for it because I, I was suddenly just doing music full time. That's the thing I was hoping for. And, you know, the, the, the accolade, the, the recognition really helps. And that just um, that just put me in a place where I could finally play music. And so I had this long awaited follow up after that. I was really, I was really eager to play new songs and have a new record in the world, but I'll bet I was also so grateful that these songs were holding up and people weren't tiring of them. I wasn't, I, I didn't write, I don't write songs that I, I, I tire of. So it was great. And, and then February, 2020 was, uh, the follow-up. Reliever. You know? <laughs> yeah, so how? what were some of the musical influences that you had in mind when you were creating Reliever? You know, for the first time, I don't think I was resting on influence. I think mm-hmm. I was finally affirmed in what I was doing, that this is just 100%, you know, from, from my depths, from my heart. And Um, now I sort of had this permission that it was okay to be myself. You know, I wanted, and that's what earthly days really did was it showed that there was a place in the world for the songs that I was creating. And I was always a little insecure about that. I don't know if these songs will do anything. And then, um, going into reliever was, you have a bit more confidence, you know, I'd also played, uh, hundreds more shows since making that last record. So I was, I guess, seasoned by the definition. And I knew what I was doing. I made half the record in Winnipeg again. And then working with Dave Cobb on the, uh, in Nashville, making, remaking Breathless. Um, that was a great fit to do the other half of the record back in Nashville, all over the place. And I just kind of went in there open and wholeheartedly not apologizing, <laughs> you know, saying I'm, I'm here and I'm confident in what I make and I'm going to let that shine rather than doubting and wondering if it's going to fit anywhere. Yeah. How would you say that working with Dave Cobb and Scott Nolan impacted how reliever sounds and feels like what's their, what's their footprint on the, on that record? Well, Scott will always, you know, I'll always credit him to having helped me find that voice, you know, to to believe in what my voice does and what my songs do, to not rush through things and allow, invite people to really listen and hear you, you know, um, that good songs don't need to be uh, overly complicated. We can support songs. We're here to serve a song. That's kind of what great writers and creators do. So that really helped. He showed me a lot and, and gave me a lot of great advice that I still lean on to this day. And then, you know, Dave is amidst like blowing up with, with all the great artists that he works with. And, and, you know, and then for him to see something in my songs and want to work with me as well was, again, another another confidence boost, another great place to, to be with this music. And so both those people, um, 
played a huge part in the sound. And um, Nashville allowed me just to play with great players and, and elevate my style of, of playing and singing. And then there was the comfort of making music in Winnipeg in the song mm-hmm. shop where we made Earthly Days. And like I say, setting the intention that we're coming in here to make a great record now really lent itself to the sound. And then, again, having that confidence that I have a small listenership who are eager to hear some kind of follow-up. And uh, then the spark, you know, just granted me another couple of years of of great touring and stuff. And these songs continue to resonate and connect with people. And then that then it became kind of a pandemic record in a sense that people were at home and then they're watching me on live streams and listening to this music, discovering me even without touring more discovery than ever. And that was really special. So reliever did its thing. It it came at, I think the exact right time for what it ended up being because a lot of people were, you know, a lot of people were in a, in a state of grieving because we had all lost our privileges and our, our, our routines and things. And at the time that record was very transformative for me. It was about, you know, losing my dad and becoming a dad and stepping, stepping away from my partner at the time. And, and I think that just really found its place in a lot of people's homes because people were also going through that, you know, loss of relationships and loved ones and not even being able to see them because of, you know, safety regulations and such. So, yeah, reliever was for me. You know, after after seeing a lot of great things and uh, writing songs about what I was living through in real time, reliever was about relief. Yeah, I'm. Well, I want to talk about my favorite vocal performance on reliever, which is lighthouse. What strikes me about Lighthouse, and it, and it kind of reminds me of some of that delicate balance you were talking about in Nashville between what's commercial and, and what's traditional. Mm-hmm. Um, that performance is very expressive, um, very authentic, but there's like such a precision and a subtlety and a restraint to it. And I'm curious how you get ready mentally and physically to record vocals on a song like that. Do you do a lot of takes? Um, are there particular rituals and warm-ups that you have to do to get yourself in this space to really execute on that type of track? Mm, uh, deep breath, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think I've always tried to be as real and authentic in the moment as I can. You know, I'm not even a... I don't have an acrobatic vocal warm-up. I just try to be rested and healthy and... Um, When it came time to that, I still remember feeling the nerves, too. Like, I'm spending two weeks working with with Dave Cobb at this point in in Nashville and playing with his great players and him and and, uh, trying, again, I think it was a real-time elevation. That's that's when I started to sing well. and, And I just wanted to... I wanted to bring the best performance to match what was around me. And so... I think really just believing in yourself is important where for a long time I had that kind of those, those clouds of doubt and do I belong? Is this, is this a song that will resonate with people? And uh, it turned out it did. And so there wasn't anything extra special to it. I'd say I, I, it was just about being as authentic and as possible, setting my intention and, and enjoying it, thinking of my son. It's a happy song, even even in the sense that it's got maybe a, a melancholy feel. It's about longing for someone. It is tr- truly about being away from my son when he was little and kind of like a sailor at sea. And so I guess I was thinking of him and I wanted to deliver something great for him. So I just think something that makes me feel good and it will, you know, transfer to tape, hopefully. Well, how has being a dad changed how you write? I mean, I can see how it would hugely impact the way that you tour, um, but how does it change your thought process going into creating the songs? I think it just makes me grateful. Um, I try to always show gratitude, and uh, he he does things in a different way. It's it's 
I think when you're truly around, like, <laughs> happiness in his capacity and innocence, innocence is another thing, seeing the world in a lens that a lot of us don't have anymore because we're all grown-ups with our grown-up problems and all the serious uh, workings of life and the world. And So what he does is he, keep, he keeps me light. He keeps me happy and... Um, he just takes me out of this realm, I think, because dad life and music life are very different. You know, I I come home and I don't really play guitar anymore or, or write and sing because our time is limited until the next engagement. And so um, in changing my life, I think it's just about, you know, you can't you can't draw good fruit from a, an unhealthy tree. And when I was writing amidst, you know, depression, anxiety, and all those things, um, Wyatt really helps shape my mind. He helps my mental space. And from that, good things are always born. Lighter melodies and jingles. And he's kind of the uh, executive producer on most things these days because I'll write something. And then a couple days later in the car, he'll be singing my idea. And something has stuck with him. So, uh, if anything, uh, he's a really good indicator of when I'm on the right track. So that's a good feeling to have. And so it's nice to have that that around all the time. And he knows all Kids my. Kids will son. do that. Yeah, it's so great. My stepson is seven, and he recently very much humbled me when I was trying to figure out an arrangement and I was listening back to the demo over and over and he just like wandered in with his toy tambourine and I was like oh that's it it's just tambourine on this last yeah. section <laughs> that's what it is we've cracked it <laughs> that's so great I want to talk about Stand in the Joy the new album that's coming out April 14th on Six Shooter Records. Yeah. It's a beautiful, beautiful album, also produced by Dave Cobb. Is that correct? Yeah, this is uh, Dave, Dave and I's first full-length effort together. Well, I want to talk about the seeds of that album. When and where did you start demoing the songs? And did you kn- did you have an idea of what it was going to turn out like sonically? Or do you kind of just start with you and the acoustic guitar and the arrangements come later? Um, I had an idea of what they would sound like fully arranged. Uh, Most, most things are created at my kitchen table, you know, a very, very uh, humble setup. I, I still like to write things to paper. So I think it all began when I finally went to Staples and bought a fresh notebook and fresh pens and said, this is what I want to create in a new, a new direction because I know I need something. I, you know, in that span too, I, I put out a gospel record. And so, uh, that was just a thing to pass, not pass time, but just to use my time better during the downtime we had. And, um, I guess this was my reintroduction. This, this album was a recalibration and it was, trying to lean more into, uh, to joy and to happiness and things around me. You know, I, I made it through a lot of the struggles and I'm here now in a place where I'm still always working at growing this thing and being a better performer, reaching a wider audience. But at the heart of it, it's still just, how can I, I don't know. I don't want to say impress, but (laughs) yeah, I guess in a way we're always trying to impress ourselves. Make an impression. You know, we're trying to be impactful to ourselves. And I just wanted to, I wanted to venture outside and, and write songs about love and happiness and being in love and, uh, being a, a dad here and, and basically just looking at my life and grabbing it, you know, um, taking in and fully enjoying it because I was kind of, I was raised in a place where sometimes happiness could be a little insensitive because a lot of people in poverty and growing up on a reserve in Canada, there's a lot of, there's a lot of struggle. And so sometimes victories and and happiness and joy can feel insensitive to those around you so much so that it's almost had this traumatic imprint on me and 
you know, with that comes a, a guilt or a shame. And just for feeling joyful in your accomplishment is that's not really a normal thing. And so this this record was about me no longer living under that veil and saying, I'm going to take my life back here in a way and, and show the good parts that I enjoy. Um, being loved by someone or loving someone and the workings that go on between a relationship that um, that is always maturing. You know, there's it gets easier and harder all the time. You know, that's the truth about love. That's this is this record could have been called Love and Time because yes. <laughs> because time is very much on the forefront of my mind when I think about you know my mortality, my health, and um, wanting to live long so that my family can be around me and. Um, what kind of imp- what kind of memory am I going to leave? You know, was my dad always, you know, will Wyatt one day say, my dad was always stressed and worried and grouchy about things happening or not happening? Or was he, was he really, you know, excited to go shoot around in the driveway and play basketball with me and go for a walk to the park? You know, he's six years old and he's very smart. And these memories, these core memories are being shaped all the time. So, yeah, it... Sometimes in the past, happiness and excitement and all those things have felt a little foreign and subdued. So this is about, this album is very much about standing, standing in the joy. To stand in the joy is to be brave and choose that joy and be courageous and and say, "I, I want to show people that I'm happy because by not doing that, I'm, I'm doing a disservice to a lot of my friends and family that are still struggling, still working through their own issues and such. So if I'm going to be an example, if I'm going to be a good light in this world, let's do it the whole way. And that's what these songs are about. Unabashedly, unapologetically joyful, happy, while still having a, a, you know, a good grasp on the things that have led me to this place as well. That's profound. And I, I think it's a really good way to put the one of the artistic struggles that's, I think, particular to folks of marginalized backgrounds. Sometimes you feel like you have to be very serious and you need to be protesting. And that's what it means to be a serious person of conscience. Um, But at the same time, if we're not showing our communities what it's like to be healed and what it's like to live fully, then we're actually just constantly reacting to the oppressor. Like we're actually just feeding into that narrative that we can only suffer. So I think it's really powerful to see the joy and the wholeness and the contentment on this album. It's a really, it's a, it's a powerful statement in a simple way. Thank you so much. You know, I've, I haven't really heard it put so eloquently and that's so great i might just use that when people ask me things too oh God, you know thank you. like <laughs> we we do you know as a first nations person from a reserve in canada there's no shortage of dealing with the ongoing intergenerational effects of colonization alcoholism substance abuse sexual abuse all these things that my community still has to live through but that community now more than ever looks to me and is so proud of me for standing on the Opry stage, for opening for Neil Young, for uh, singing songs with Serena Ryder, for all the accomplishments I've done. Um, that's all great and wonderful. Um, if that, if I can't process that and let it make me more joyful and happy at home when people aren't seeing me on stage, you know, it's kind of pointless. So I'm really challenging myself on this album to to smile more, to to be lighter of heart and show a softer, different side of me that isn't always so serious for the sake of if I'm never if I never step out of line, if I never say the wrong thing, I'll never be reprimanded and this won't go away, you know. So there's that that fear, that shame I'm trying to shake, the guilt, the worry. You know, I have a song called Wasted, and somebody asked me, what is a day wasted? And I said, it's the days that we spend in doubt and fear and regret. And something that I saw was that when we are grateful, we can't be doubtful, fearful, or feeling regret. And so this is more a gratitude to, wow, I can't believe we're here right now. Look at this. Look at these 
near amazing things that are happening Mm -hmm. to me, you know? Um, I try to always be a realist and things are really great. Things are really good. And um, in these, there are moments that are truly amazing. And like being on the Opry was one of them. And to have my home community, a community that truthfully I didn't really fit into at first because I was a newcomer. I moved there in grade five. And, you know, it took me a while to fit in, to be accepted. And now that community lifts me up higher than anybody for the most part. And so, yeah, I want to, I want to stand in the joy. I try every day to, to be happy and I want more people to feel that. Now I want to think about the song young, um, which is such a great song on this new album. And I'm, there's a lyric in it that says now that we're free and not just fine. Um, which I think is a really interesting distinction in the context of what we've been talking about as far as standing in the joy and and showing an example to your community, has the concept of freedom changed for you as you've gotten older? What is it? What does freedom look like to you now? Yeah, now that we're free and I'm just fine. You oh, know? and I'm just fine. Yeah. Okay, I'm re- I'm rethinking it because I thought it said now that we're free and not just fine. Yeah. And so I was like kind of shocked by that and and curious. Yeah, well, it, I guess it could work both <laughs> ways in the sense. Yeah, but yours it's, is better. <laughs> no, I, I think about it as when we're sitting around, um, that, that line is really about worry and insecurity. You know, when I was, you know, a teenager wondering what my place in this life is going to be. And I spent a lot of my young years worrying about, well, what's retirement going to look like? What's, you know, like these are not normal you know, things for a teenager to be worrying about. And it's because I saw such struggle with my family and my parents and like, what can I do so that it's not hit or miss if we're getting groceries this month, that uh, we can rely on the, there to be gas in the tank. Like all these little events that I had to live through so many times really affected me in my adulthood or at least thinking about my adulthood. That's why I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to go to med school. I I started my journey in sciences. I wrote my MCAT. I applied and didn't get in. But I thought if I can become a respected physician, everywhere I go, people will not look at me as just a First Nations person, just an indigenous man, because there's a lot of negative stigma that can come with that. And at least people would look me in the eye and say, he's obviously intelligent. He's obviously... You know, look how he's dressed. He's not stealing anything from this place. I don't have to follow him. I don't, you know, um, I'm not worried that he's a violent person or something. Um, and just any other notion that might come with that, with with being the uh, First Nations. And now we've arrived at this place where who would have thought, you know, music was going to do that for me. When I step into a room now, People are excited to see me. They welcome me and they they're they they pay their real money to sit in theaters and watch me sing these songs, just a guitar and I most of the time. And so it's almost a line to laugh at. Like we could have almost spared ourselves all that worry now that we're fine. Fine in whatever sense it is that, hey, your bills are paid, you have a nice home where your son is safe, he has everything he needs, your partner is looked after she has everything she needs and at the same time at the end of the day you still have love you still have your mother and you still have all this opportunity like look at this life we're only we're just standing around at the doorway of destiny and greatness and I'm so thankful that I get to live it and be a part of it and you know so that that line is very much about I could have spared myself a lot a lot of worry had I uh, just had more faith, perhaps, I don't know what you could, so. <laughs> yeah, if you had been able to see how it would turn out. I'm yeah. curious if that, that, that feeling that you have to compensate for how people might perceive you, like that stereotype threat, as a First Nations person that travels all over the world sharing your music, um, is that uncertainty about how you're going to be received something that still affects you 
in your performances and how you're meeting fans, how you're showing up on your tours? I think now my, my following has made it really safe for me. The people that I meet, um, they're often, you know, empaths. They're, they're people who care and there are people, they are people that have a heart for those of us that are marginalized, that believe in, in a fairness and equality, respect and for everybody. And so I think I feel safest at my shows when I'm there, because when I do meet people, um, they're often, well, more times <laughs> than not crying or, you know, I'll have these very, very moving moments with people where they say, I, I too lost my dad or I lost a child or I lost a friend. And your music was the thing that helped me through. And um, it's not as exciting maybe as a global hit, but it's definitely serving the people the way I wanted it to. And so I meet like-minded individuals because I think that's what it takes to truly sit with this music and enjoy it. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something. It's, it's really it's given me the confidence to be who I am everywhere I go. And so I'm very fortunate, very lucky to have that, that I feel safe and good about where I go with this music. I have another question about the new album. Uh, was this your first time recording with your fiance? Is it Alicia? Yeah. She's she was she is a, a featured vocalist on mm. this album. What was that like working together? Well, we've been together four years now, so she's always sang. She's a much better singer than I am, and she's a musical theater kid. So at first, it was a uh, you know we were learning how to sing with each other, and just over the over twenty twenty, like that's all we could do was just sing at home and. So I'm not easy to sing with to begin with. I'm not a traditional, okay, just follow him with this harmony, you know, especially live. Like I can, I just go with what I'm feeling and I'm not a technical singer. So to sing along with me takes, takes some, well, a special skill that she possesses. And even Dave Cobb remarked on it, like, you're not uh, like (laughs) that traditional voice where somebody could come in there and dominate the subtlety that is this music. And so you have to be pretty close, I think, to intertwine and speak at the same time in the same way. And it was really neat because we'd cut the record. In the first week, it was my friend Mike T. Kerr from Toronto. Um, And then Dave and his players that... um, he brought in Chris Powell on drums and Brian Allen on bass. And we all just sat in a circle and we made this record. So when she arrived, the songs were actually closer to the vision I had in my mind the whole time and drums and organs and pianos. And so I think it was more of a walk in the park for her. It was just a matter of her, again, believing in herself to go there and sing. And I knew she was going to knock it out of the park. I wasn't even in the room when she was cutting her sessions. So (laughs) that's trust, you know, so we have that trust. And so Brandon Bell was the engineer and he would, uh, he just set up the session and Dave would come listen once in a while and loved it. Just loved it. And so did I. And it's, uh, they are the only harmonies on the record is, is her voice. And she has a talent for, singing in a lower register too that really blends nicely so it was a walk in the park i was really proud to have her there and have her singing it's a bold statement to make you know putting uh we weren't engaged at the time but putting a partner on the record she's on the album cover and you know this is uh this is a step in the faithful direction that we're going to be together and the ultimate sign of showing her that i see her as an equal, as a a partner, was to share the most intimate thing. And that's the music I create because your voice is then going into the ears of those that trust me to deliver something meaningful. And so 
Yeah, it, it was uh, it was just like being at home, but I guess under the microscope in a way, and right, it it all that's a, that's out. kind of as good as it gets. I think when it comes to uh, collaboration, yeah. it sounds like very natural. So yeah. it was, um, I'm so so happy and grateful that she was able to sing on the record. Now, as a singer songwriter who prioritizes the poetry of your music, do you have best practices as far as incorporating drums? into your music and and filling out arrangements rhythmically um, where it feels full, feels like full band, but the poetry is still at the forefront? Yeah, every, luckily every producer I've worked with has seen that the strength lies in putting my voice at the forefront. You know, if this were a movie, uh, they want to give my voice the starring role and um, tasteful drums are key to that. And Chris Powell is an incredible player. Um, this is only the second record, you know, Gospel First Nation and this record I made with drums from the beginning. So their groove is more noticeable. It's it's more fitted versus Earthly Days and Reliever, at least the Winnipeg version, the sessions were um, kind of done in reverse where I would record all my parts, vocal, acoustic, uh, piano often. And then at the end, we thought, maybe this could use some drums because this was going to be almost just a purely acoustic record. So to find a drummer that can do that and go backwards. Wait, had you recorded to a click? Yes. So Okay, that's the saving grace, yeah. so I guess. But that's still incredibly hard to uh, reverse engineer a drum fill in that way. Oh, totally. Any drummers out there I know are shaking their head right now, but if uh, if you've never been in a recording studio you'll put headphones on and you'll hear this ticking little tick, 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 tick. And it can totally rob you of feel if you're not used to it or you can become more rigid and such. So uh, luckily I grew up a rhythm player. So I had a fair amount, amount of experience with, you know, good rhythm music, good, good rhythm guitar. And we were able to work backwards from there. Reliever, um, some of it wasn't to a click track, so even more, you know, uh, love. To I just the started sweating hearing that. <laughs> I know, right? And I don't have the courage, and I'm actually really glad that I didn't know that that's how it was recorded before I listened, because I think I would have gone in with such anxiety. Mm. It's amazing that that, that how natural the um, the rhythm is, even though it, it was recorded in that way. That's yeah, fascinating. I'd, Lots of practice in the church band, I guess. That's what it comes back to. Church People that play in church, you you can usually count on to be mm. on time in more, more ways than one. Yeah, I learned. I learned by playing with people who weren't on time. So I'd have to kind of take over. And my dad was good at that, too. He, he put a lot of uh, weight on just how important timing is. I just like anything in life. Timing is key, and I, I, I'm excited now to, I'm hoping to purchase a home in the next year or so, you know, um, we kind of bounced around during the pandemic, and our plans were changed and such, so I'd like to build a small rehearsal space, mainly so I can stop paying for studios to rehearse with my band, but I've never created music starting with drums. So that's an exciting thing to to write with drums rather than just imagine them, you know? And I think that's going to take this in a really great direction too. Stand in the Joy was written uh, as a band record. I wanted, I, I pictured big parts. I think of Tanqueray, you know, like I wanted it to be a ballad that soared. And if I ever got to open in an arena, you know, I'll have some songs that can, can belt out. I love... I, I love the, the rhythm and belting of John Fogarty, CCR music, you know, and I think of great grooves and how that, again, fec affects that biology we were talking about, the physiology in people. And so that's the next step for me is to write with drums rather than imagine them. But Stand in, Stand in the Joy, thankfully, lent itself to that upbeat, you know, nature. And again, we... We did everything to serve the song, and that's why it's become my favorite record. I think this is, you know, you can tell by going over them that something's changing here, and 
I'm really, really proud of this one. That's why I want people, if they're just discovering me for the first time, this is where I'm not a, I'm, I'm not always sad and heavy. I'm not uh, a Christian. I'm not a gospel singer. I was just influenced by gospel music. I, I just want to be an artist and a songwriter who happens to be First Nations and isn't held back by being Canadian or indigenous and just holds my own. And that's what I've always wanted to do because the song will speak for itself. And it's exciting. You know, that's that's one of the most gratifying things in my life, I think, next to being a dad and um, my, my life at home is when songs resonate with people. I just heard you for the first time on on CBS, found you on the radio. Oh my goodness, I was walking through a grocery store and my one play of the week on that bigger station just happened to be in that person's ears. So that will, that remains the most rewarding part of this journey. And so it's up to me to be healthy and conscious and thoughtful enough to keep doing that. I have one more question for you, kind of on the topic of that gospel EP that you put out. I read in an interview with you that you've stepped away from the type of Christian tradition that you grew up with, and you describe yourself as a spiritual universalist. Um, I'm interested in the process of coming to a new belief system. Like once you knew what you didn't want from your faith, how did you go about figuring out what you did want and what did feel true to you? Um, Was there research involved? Was it trial and error of like, I think I might believe this? You know, how did, how did you figure out how to come up with a sort of a new worldview based on a blending of traditions and and experiences? I think just spending time with people was the best thing. Um, Because, you know, being rooted heavily in that, that Christian tradition was really stifling, I think, you know. Don't uh, don't drink a beer. Don't go to the party because you'll be condemned to hell for it. You know, I missed out on a lot of opportunity playing it safe for, you know, one day when the role is called up yonder and say, well, he did a good job obeying me to a T. I think he can pass on to this next phase of whatever it is. But the truth is, I believe in the universe and the cosmos and and physics, you know, time um, energy is neither created nor destroyed. We just carry on as spiritual beings and v- different vehicles. And whether I am a country singer or a tree, you know, it's the, the two lend each other. They lend themselves to each other by being a real person, a, a good person. And I'm trying to buy back some of that stuff because I, I wasn't always, and I'm still struggling. I still struggle with the trauma that's been left on me from growing up in that environment of colonization and witnessing what truly hurt people live like. And my dad was one of them. My dad was abused in day school. And my dad took that out on us because he didn't really have the capacity to deal with what the thing actually was. So now through therapy, now through exploring my indigeneity for looking at like, wow, these thousands of year old you know, the, the First Nations people, we were the first people on Turtle Island, North America. We lived here before anyone else. And we had the mentality even then to share back then. It's the Anishinaabe way is not how much we can attain, but how much we can give away. And I really just tried to be a generous person. Um, I'm trying my best uh, to raise a good son so that he is not somebody that... Um, puts more hurt in the world, you know, he will be patient with others, unlike I've been in the past. And I had a lot of learning and growing up to do. And so my worldview started to change when it's, you know, it's not, it's not under some form, some spiritual foreman's blueprint that I'm going to be a good person. It's, it's me. I have to be accountable. I, at the root of everything, you know, I can't blame a God. I can't blame anybody for how my life is going. I, I have to just face it head on and realize that some circumstances have shaped me, but those circumstances will not keep me held in a place that I can't do good and be good for others to be that light I speak of. And at the same time, um, 
really leaning into just what it is that cultural teaching, the beautiful practice of acknowledging that we are held in the caring arms of a mother, the earth that provides for us through the, through the water. You know, water is life. That's one of the main focal points of any indigenous protest is the protection of natural resource so that we as a, as humanity, as people can keep going, you know, more condos and more pavement and more concrete aren't going to help us in a hundred years from now. And if we want to leave any world for our future generations, our children who are then going to keep advocating. I love young people these days who are defiant and won't allow themselves to be um, oppressed in that same way where before you just had to take it and put up with it. Cell phones and cameras and, you know, pages on the internet that advocate for those that need advocating. That's where the future's headed, not into the pockets of more corporate greed and more fame. We don't need more fame. We don't need more money. We need more empaths. We need more people that are truly concerned with, and if that means protesting on the front lines of, you know, Standing Rock or switching to sustainable water receptacles, some small part is adding up in a way. And I'm trying to do a little of each. I try to use any influence I have to lift up other indigenous artists as well as other causes. You know, Gospel First Nation was born out of my my wanting to contribute something to the Black Lives Matter movement, where I just felt in my soul that people for so long have been wronged and now we're just seeing it. And so I always kind of react in that way. But stepping away from faith, because I, in my adulthood, I finally got all the information. Unfortunately, Christianity in Canada and most places, in the act of colonization, it was used to kill the identity, to remove the Indian identity from children, to put them into residential schools that we're just now learning about. I don't know if you've heard, but the uncovering of so many mass graves in Canada where thousands... It's an atrocity in the U.S. as well. Like, imagine, how is this even a thing where the government, the RCMP, and the church were allowed to take your children from your home and give them an entirely new culture and identity in hopes of forming a great nation that is Canada or whatever. So that's a sensitive subject too. But so I, then, yeah, and it wasn't really for the kids. No. I think that the, nowadays, you know, I grew up evangelical and it gets a softer, it gets a, they, there's sort of an attempt to make it softer. Like it's about saving the kids. It really was about building a white nation. Yes. In, I mean, that's one woman's opinion. I don't want to speak for you, but... And that's a tough that's a tough thing for people to swallow because a lot of Canadians, a lot of settlers, a lot of non-indigenous people think that we're coming for your identity. We don't we don't want your your hockey and your, you know, <laughs> whatever it is that you love as a Canadian. Whatever it is that makes you want to wear that flag every day um we're not coming for that. We're looking for empathy. We're looking for people who will expedite the process of true reconciliation. That's a huge word in Canada is the idea of, well, here we are, ladies and gentlemen, at this at this sporting event. We'd like to acknowledge that it's happening on Indigenous land. And at the same time, we're not going to give it back. And we're not going to do anything to facilitate making it better. And you know what that is? That's as simple as... Um, finding ways to deal with this intergenerational trauma. And I just don't see the church doing that. I don't see them as leaders in that. There is so much money for more stained glass windows and the upkeep of thousand year old buildings, but there's not clean drinking water on reserves. You know, there's not resources for dealing with the systemic abuse that filters down from great grandfathers generations before that's affecting the kids you see on the streets today. The ones that come to your window asking for a handout, as they say, when really it's their entitlement because this was those First Nations children's land long before any contact happened. And so the church was not not my place. And like my mother is still a wholehearted believer. I'll never 
condemn anyone for their beliefs. The First Nations Anishinaabe people believe in the possibility of many truths. How could there not be? Look at how long time has been around. Look at the mountains and everything that's been here before us and civilizations from thousands of years ago. But we're supposed There's a difference between respectfully coexisting amongst a variety of beliefs and there's a difference between that type of acceptance mm-hmm. and accepting the violence that has been done in the name of religion. I think we can draw a line where it's, this isn't about coming for people's beliefs and faiths. Yeah. If those beliefs are truly held, it's about, let's all, let's all join the reality where we acknowledge harm that's been done and work on, on reconciling it mm-hmm. and, and making it right. Yeah. The just get over it mentality isn't serving anybody. It makes the oppressor look even more ignorant and careless. And it just totally invalidates the past and the present of anybody trying to navigate it today. And so um, that (laughs) Christianity in the church didn't, doesn't need another poster boy in me, you know, and it's actually done somewhat of a, uh, a disservice because now people may shy away or I get playlisted in a different geography because of this album, because, you know, um, where I'm, I'm trying to be amongst the Charlie Crockett's and the Coulter walls and the Jason Isbell's and the Stapleton's, the people, um, you know, that have their music made by the same person that's making my music. And, Again, it's that hurdle of being indigenous, of being Canadian, of a true outsider. I'm transferring to a whole new school and trying to fit in and I'm working hard at it. Um, But with that, I'm always hopeful. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't enjoying it. And I like changing people's opinion. I like, you know, I, I carry my ancestors on my back through every glass ceiling we shatter on this journey. And for that and with that, I will stand in the joy. I will I will lift up those around me. I will do my best to be happy and to thrash against all the negativity in my mind and that has been in my past. And uh, this album is very much about that, embracing it and being courageous and and letting letting love, letting letting all those things lift me up rather than the other stuff keep me down. So that's where we're at with this record. The most current representation of where my mind is at is, is here, living in love, trying to make the most of the time that I have, and hopefully along the way, um, to do some good and inspire others around me. William, you've been such a fantastic guest. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time and telling your story, and I am so excited for our listeners to hear your new album. It's out on April 14th. Everybody go follow William Prince on social media and catch him when he comes to your town to play live. The songs are fantastic. Thank you so much for this. This is just such a joy and I appreciate you being here today too. Thank you. Thank you. This episode of Basic Folk was produced by me, Cindy Howes, Our music was composed by Alex Stanton. Basic Focus on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network. You can find all of our episodes there, wherever you get podcasts. You can search for us on the SiriusXM app under Basic Folk, or you can check out our website, basicfolk.com. All right, thanks for listening all the way to the end to the podcast. We will talk to you next time. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. That was different.